Good afternoon. Um, we have a very special session of I Am the Cavalry. We are going to talk medicine, medical industry, medical devices, and we're going to talk about systemic change that has happened over the last 10 years. It is my privilege and delight to introduce Dr. Suzanne Schwartz from the Food and Drug Administration. <laughs> Dr. Schwartz is nothing less than a national treasure who has since late 2014 <laughs> brought about more change as to communications between, I'll call it the hacker community and .gov, federal bureaucracy, which has led to systemic changes in the FDA and other departments in the U.S. government. And so we just, we couldn't be any happier to have Dr. Schwartz here to give a couple of introductory statements. Um, and then we, we have a, we have a, a vast team uh, from the FDA here to also visit. So people will be spiking in and out. It's going to be a very exciting, about two hours. So buckle up. Here we go. Dr. Schwartz. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it, it's really, it's a pleasure and it's really an honor to be here. And, um, and yes, we did bring our entire posse, or almost our entire posse with us um, from FDA because this is a special moment. Um, it is the 10 year anniversary of the I Am The Cavalry work. And, and so we're here from FDA's medical device cybersecurity team to celebrate this milestone with you. A little bit more just introduction in terms of context for me. Again, my name is Suzanne, Suzanne Schwartz, and I'm the director of the Office of Strategic Partnerships and Technology Innovation at FDA's Center for Devices and Radiological Health. And um, I have to say, thank you, okay. I have to say that I, I struggled um, for quite some time to collect my thoughts for this session because of really the enormity of this topic. Um, where to begin, what is it that I want to cover, how to keep from rambling and going down various tangential paths, how to hold on to your interest and your engagement, and it isn't easy. It's, for me, much like kind of um, taking a stroll, walking in the woods and coming across these diverging trails and each of one of those trails can take you down a very, very different direction. And yet, really, there is no right or wrong way to tell this story. So I resolved that to navigate along this journey for myself, reflecting over the past 10 years, I use the title of this session, Saving Lives in Healthcare, Trust, Teamwork, and Tangible Outcomes, which is really most befitting um, as that can serve as my compass, really orienting me by breaking the title down into separate, very manageable headings, if you will. So let's start with saving lives in healthcare. Uh, this is for us in simply another way to state our mission at FDA, which is to protect and promote or advance the public health. And we do this through regulatory oversight of medical products. In our case at the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, this is specific to medical devices. And furthermore, we take what is called a total product life cycle or TPLC approach, meaning that our responsibilities begin at the pre-market submission phase. And once we authorize a medical device to allow it onto the market, our regulatory oversight extends throughout the post-market for the entirety of the device's use life. So why is this important? Because a patient safety concern or a risk of patient harm may not necessarily manifest until years after a device has gone onto the market, despite, despite meticulous pre-market review, which includes careful, thoughtful clinical considerations of what we call the benefit risk calculus. And parenthetically, let me just add here that there is no such thing as a risk-free medical product. 
I don't know if that comes as a surprise to the audience, but it's important to state that, right? Um, the key is for there to be a thorough vetting of risks, meaning we have to be able to, and the manufacturer needs to be able to identify what the risks are, to fully understand the implications of the risks to patient safety, and appropriately reducing risk to an acceptable level through different means, through different types of controls that may need to be designed into the product or in the after the products on the market, other types of controls to be put in place depending upon the environment. The public depends upon FDA to uphold these oversight responsibilities so that there is, in what we call regulatory or legal parlance, a reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness. And any erosion in public confidence in the safe performance of medical devices can perilously lead to breakdown in the public's trust. And that includes all of our stakeholders, patients and their loved ones, caregivers, health care providers, and yes, security researchers such as yourselves. For more than 10 years now, security researchers have called attention to device vulnerabilities that they've identified, conducting impact and variant analyses and at times announcing their findings at Black Hat and DEF CON, much to the dismay of the medical device industry, evoking consternation within the healthcare ecosystem and worrying patients who rely upon these devices for their health and well being. To say that trust was fractured between device manufacturers and security researchers and between security researchers and FDA would be a gross understatement. Trust simply didn't exist in those years leading up to 2013, 2014. I know I was there. Much work would need to be done together to begin laying a foundation upon which trust could then be built. Reflecting back, there were so many facets to undertaking this challenge, but I think the common thread that runs throughout is starting from a place of empathy, active listening, creating space for hearing different perspectives, giving voice to the security research community within, with a deep understanding that indeed we seek a common goal to keep patients safe from harm. Yet FDA historically had not had any explicit authorities within the realm of cybersecurity of medical products we regulate. There was a lot, and I mean a lot, for us to learn and to delve into regarding our understanding of risks associated with cyber vulnerabilities identified in medical devices. We didn't even have a dedicated medical device cybersecurity team, let alone a program. We essentially stood up in 2013 a nascent effort within our emergency preparedness and response program, of which I was the director at the time, to start us off getting up to speed on cyber, even whilst our program was most accustomed to dealing with all other natural and human-made disasters, including chem, bio, rad nuke threats, infectious outbreaks associated with medical devices and explosive events. Now we needed to drill down and learn what was happening across other parts of the US government on this front, including interacting with Department of Homeland Security, getting to know all of the great initiatives that were being launched out of NTIA and the Department of Commerce, NIST, Department of Defense, FTC, FCC, FCC, just to name a few of the various agencies for which various work streams were already happening or were well along the way in cybersecurity for which we really had had no prior visibility. And this was what we needed to do in order to move from what had been 
in what was really a very reactive posture to a proactive stance. We needed to develop coordinated response plans. And while we were learning ourselves, we also needed to raise awareness within our own sector of healthcare and public health. Imagine trying to do all of that at the same time when you're first trying to really understand exactly the state of the ecosystem. To complicate things at a more macro level, the prevailing thinking at this time across the healthcare ecosystem and therefore across the healthcare public health sector of critical infrastructure with that, these are theoretical vulnerabilities merely relegated to the hypothetical arena. No one would ever even dare to exploit these vulnerabilities and cause deliberate harm to patients. There was a palpable undercurrent of dismissing serious consideration of identified device vulnerabilities. And advances that would happen in this space clearly would have to occur through a mindset shift across the culture of the healthcare ecosystem. And that would necessitate baby steps. Or as Josh likes to say, you have to crawl before you walk, before you run. And teaming up with I Am The Cavalry empowered us to take those steps, developing what I've often called over the years a whole of community approach, engaging all of our stakeholders Josh and Bo <laughs> mobilized the security researcher community via I Am The Cavalry to meet with us at FDA on several occasions and to maintain open lines of dialogue so that together we did enable the culture to evolve and supporting one another to attain the common goal of safer medical devices where cybersecurity is not neglected. And so doing, we've experienced important, tangible outcomes along the way. Before my team actually comes up to introduce themselves and to fast forward then to the most recent tangible, tangible outcome, which was indeed years in the making, I want to first highlight some important milestones along the way that led us to the present in which I Am The Cavalry has been our partner and collaborator. So while it's true that 10 years ago, I Am The Cavalry, it's your, it's I Am The Cavalry's anniversary. It's also FDA's anniversary of 10 years since 2013 when we were confronted with some uh, issues around medical device cybersecurity and um, initially issued our first draft uh, pre-market guidance. In 2014, though, we convened our first FDA public workshop on medical device cybersecurity. And very much in the spirit of collaboration, of creating whole of community, of recognizing that everyone has a part to play, that there's shared responsibility um, here. This initial public workshop was co-sponsored by Department of Homeland Security, with whom we had already begun a fair amount of work, as well as with the what's now called the Healthcare ISAC, and then it was the NHISAC, the National Health ISAC. That occurred at the same time with our release of the pre-market guidance as final. That was our first guidance, really, um, on the pre-market management of cybersecurity medical devices. And it was there at, uh, in 2014, certainly that I have very clear memories of both uh, Bo and Josh attending the workshop and being part of what was actually quite an amount of friction, tension um, within the room among various parties. In 2015, FDA issued its first safety communication on cyber on a cyber vulnerability of a medical device, specifically an infusion pump. And uh, this vulnerability was discovered by a very prominent security researcher who, in years prior, I don't think he ever dreamed of having exchanges and interactions and working together with FDA. But we had really turned the corner 
and um, in so doing, working together with this security researcher and as well as with the manufacturer, we did issue what, again, was the very, very first safety communi communication that called out a cyber-related vulnerability of a medical device. And I can remember to this day, although because I was sitting in my office at FDA on the White Oak campus, all the, and I had not attended uh, B sides or any of the you know hacker conferences, but because this was such a pivotal or transformative moment, um, I was patched in by phone, <laughs> not by Zoom or any by virtually, but literally by phone um, into the room to talk about this moment, this release of the safety communication and what its implications were as far as the work that we take seriously in the area of medical device cybersecurity. And more than that, how much we value the security researcher community and the importance of what this community brings to as a contribution to the um, to the ecosystem in the betterment of public health and protecting patients. I'm going to move along into 2016, and because we were definitely making progress with I and the Cavalry and with the security researcher community, recognizing the importance of what additional information and understanding we glean at FDA from the work, the important work that's being done. We participated in a request for what was the Digital Millennium Copyright Act exemption, the DMCA exemption um, for security research to take place on medical devices, again, with the driver, the motivation being protecting patients. And, um, and this also was in some ways another kind of inflection point in terms of being very public in recognition in a letter that was sent to Library of Congress that FDA um, endorses the exemption to the DMCA. Um, and that really opened up a lot more opportunity for the kind of collaboration we were going to be having with the security research community. This is definitely coming back to building trust and understanding how to communicate in a way that we understand one another and that we are you know empathetic towards what where you know each party really is within the ecosystem and what our responsibilities are further in 2016 you know be, as we were kind of moving along from a policy perspective we had issued first as draft and then finalized our post market guidance on cybersecurity and managing cybersecurity of medical devices that are on the market. And I, I have to say that a lot of the approaches and the policy and the guidance was very much informed by the work that we were doing with I and the Calvary, with the security researcher community collectively um, in understanding exactly what, you know, what was really within the art of the possible, how important it is to be able to identify vulnerabilities, assess them in a prompt manner and deal with them in terms of reduction of risk also in an expedient manner as possible. And all of that helped inform the approach from a policy perspective that we took for post-market. We, in addition, convened a public workshop um, with that guidance as well. And, and I know that my, my friends and colleagues here uh, were very active participants on several panels and in discussions in that workshop that again helped inform the finalization of that guidance. A very integral piece of that guidance was the concept of coordinated vulnerability disclosure and the importance of having policies and processes in place that manufacturers should have as a best practice, as a recommendation in order to ingest information around vulnerabilities, process, analyze that information, and then appropriately disclose that information. 
And, um, and that work was also further informed, you know, by all of the NTIA initiative in which I, yeah, the, I and the cavalry uh, community was heavily involved in as well. One of the other pieces that kind of came out of our own learnings as we're kind of going through all of this journey, um, and, and I think this was 2016, although, I, you know, it may have been a little bit earlier, maybe a little bit later. We posted on our website a myth busting fact sheet. Um, and we did that because we kept on getting these queries um, from healthcare providers um, as well as from people in general saying, oh, you know, um, uh, FDA, you know, we understand cybersecurity is optional. It's not, you know, um, it, it's it, you don't have to have cybersecurity in medical devices. Also, um, providers were telling us that, uh, or provider organizations were telling us that they cannot, they are not permitted to provide updates or patches or fixes to identified vulnerabilities because that would decertify, decertify or invalidate the certification of a legally marketed medical device. And, you know, and so gathering a lot of these um, myths, um, it was important for us to speak the truth um, and to provide that not only publicly on our website, but to further really arm um, the healthcare providers with those facts that they can take back to the manufacturers. And if they were having issues, to bring those challenges to us as well. But, you know, again, a lot of all of these these activities and items that I'm mentioning, um, they don't happen in a silo. They don't happen in a vacuum. They're all informed by the learnings that the FDA team was, um, you know, uh, was going through as well as the collaboration that we were doing with the entirety of the community, um, recognizing that, yeah, this is evolving. We're evolving along at the same time, and as we learn and as our, you know, uh, understanding of what the concerns are sharpen um, and become clearer, then we'll be able to address those even better. In the 2016 through 2017 time frame, um, you also had what was a mandated requ a requirement that was put into statute um, by by Congress um, for HHS, the Department of um, Health and Human Services, to convene a task force, a task force um, that would study, do an appraisal of the healthcare systems, the healthcare, you know, sector at large from a cybersecurity perspective. And not only would it do that initial landscape analysis, but in addition to that, it would come up with a set of imperatives or recommendations that would then further strengthen um, and address the, you know, the concerns, the exposed areas within healthcare that um, were drawing attention um, of Congress and others. And we at FDA, because we were heavily engaged on this really from the medical device side, were in a position to be able to nominate um, a subject matter expert to participate in this important task force. And um, it was clear to us that someone who is bringing um, uh, uh, recognition, subject matter expertise, and such respect from the security researcher community was really going to be critical to have on this task force. And, and Josh Corman served on this task force, which culminated in the issuance of a report in 2017. Much of the pieces within that task force that addressed specifically needs on the medical device side are ones that we 
have um, in some way, shape or form undertaken further study of or further execution of as part of the work that we have continued to do. Moving right along, um, so 2018, well, 2016, 17, I, I know I participated here as well um, in uh, the, uh, the summer, you know, hacker camp. And um, it's always been um, great um, exposure for me and for members of my team. The members of the team then are different than the members of the team that I have with me here today. Um, but we are a growing um, and a, uh, a very, very strong team. Um, 2018, as part of socializing um, the work that was that is being done on the FDA side and furthering to build trust with the I and the cavalry and security researcher community, we had the opportunity to uh, you know to provide support as well to the medical device hacking lab at DEF CON, and this was a small lab, um, and. It would be um, it, it would be an omission to not mention the fact that there have been medical device manufacturers who've really been on the leading edge um, and have really spearheaded much of the effort in medical device cybersecurity who raised their hand and volunteered to bring their devices to the medical device hacking lab and to you know and to be very open towards having researchers, having hackers come and really try to penetrate, right, and try to hack into these devices. Um, this, you know, was another real turning point for us to the extent that my center director, Jeff Shuren, would go to different meetings among medical device manufacturers like AdvaMed, the trade organization, the MedTech meetings, and he would speak to the press and he would say when questions would come up around medical device cybersecurity, he'd say, my answer to you, to companies is, you need to hire a hacker. And hire a hacker became like really, you know, the, the phrase of, um, uh, you know, that, that would appear in some of the press. Um, but it just goes to show the capabilities um, that a community, that um, a community can rally together, can mobilize, and with the you know with the right um, uh, you know motivation towards protecting patients, towards making devices safer um, and better protected, that you can really bring about transformative change. Now, I haven't even gotten to like the really, really big change yet, but this just kind of, just as a footnote, shows you along the way how important it was for us to bring into our community of collaborators and stakeholders a group that we previously had no contact with in years prior. Um, and this community became a very strong voice and an important voice as part of the work that we do in developing policy and in the day-to-day -day identifying of vulnerabilities, disclosing those vulnerabilities and, um, and communicating them you know, to, to patients and to the public. In 2018, we released um, an updated version of our pre-market guidance. Remember the guidance I mentioned back in 2014? Well, obviously there's been so much evolution happening within the medical device cybersecurity space and we were learning as we were going along that we had made a commitment internally to, you know, to ourselves that this is not static, this is a dynamic area and as we continue to learn, we're gonna continue to raise the bar and our expectations of manufacturers are gonna be, be raised as well. And the contents of this 2018 guidance um, really reflected that. It reflected it in, in areas such as 
transparency, reflecting on the concept of what we call then cybersecurity bill of materials, but we were drawing from all of the work that had been done through NTIA on software transparency and a software bill of materials recognizing that this, you know, is, um, is a very critical aspect of being able to manage risk within medical devices. And there were many other parts, you know, trust, transparency, and resilience were kind of the three legs of the stool that I talked about in terms of, um, of that particular guidance. Um, and, and that was released as draft. We also convened a public workshop in early 2019 for a discussion of this guidance. Again, using that kind of a venue for soliciting feedback, soliciting perspective on what's, what's in the art of the possible, what's feasible, what's not feasible, aside from the public comment period that occurs every time a guidance goes out. Um, and um, it was important feedback that we received from really all, you know, all stakeholders within the ecosystem, including the security researcher community, which we took into account and incorporated as we look to develop future guidances. We also, this isn't even in my notes, but I'm remembering it as I'm reflecting. Um, we also issued in 2018 a medical device safety action plan, which incorporated within it um, a huge section on medical device cybersecurity. And in that section, we highlighted the importance of, you know, not only the collaborative nature of what we were doing, but we were at that point already recognizing that there are going to be some areas, some gap areas where, you know what, the FDA probably needs to have explicit legislative regulatory authorities in order to require certain aspects of medical device cybersecurity. Coordinated vulnerability disclosure was one of them that we called out. Software Bill of Materials was another area that we called out. Another one was that, you know, medical device manufacturers in providing their pre-market submissions to the agency need to be able to provide data and evidence to support that the device can be patched and updated and still function safely and effectively. So it was really drawing from everything that we were experiencing, both on the pre-market side as well as on the post-market side with some of the challenges around legacy as well, that convinced us, compelled us in many ways to socialize this within the medical device safety action plan. And, um, and, and this was you know, an important kind of also cornerstone document because it is the first place where we talk about the fact that we are considering seeking these additional authorities, these additional requirements. What was really exciting in 2019, just to go back there for a second, is when we had our public workshop to review the 2018 guidance, we also announced the launch of the We Heart Hackers initiative. And we had spent quite a bit of time in the months leading up to the workshop and to this launch, working together with I and the Calvary, working together with the medical device manufacturing community to identify manufacturers who were gonna be courageous, who were gonna be you know, willing to kind of, again, be leaders of the pack and to also to raise their hand and indicate that Yes, they are going to provide, to bring their medical devices and systems to the conferences, um, to DEF CON in, in the summer, and that we'd be able to kind of create what became actually a makeshift hospital with these devices residing in different areas of the hospital, um, whether it's an ICU or an OR or a pediatric unit, you know, to have the appropriate devices there and for hackers to come in and to really, you know, experience where these devices work, how they're supposed to work, and are they hackable. This was a um, another kind of 
pivotal moment for us, especially since we had the strong support and backing of the FDA commissioner at the time, Scott Gottlieb, who announced this uh, initiative in his opening remarks at the workshop and who subsequently put it out on his Twitter feed um, for, you know, for everyone to see that this was an important move for us to make. And um, and indeed, I mean, it was um, it was quite um, quite an experience to behold uh, Bo very much instrumental in really putting together this entire makeshift hospital um, that um, that really brought I don't even know how many people came through, but it was pretty it was really very impressive. Throughout these years, we've also been privileged and honored to participate in the CyberMed Summits, which had its inaugural event in Phoenix, Arizona, back, I, I want to say, 2017, um, followed then by moving to San Diego. And then recently, in the past two years, we've had the addition of spring summits taking place in DC, which are very much policy oriented because of the agencies in Congress and policymakers here. Um, they deserve a really extra special call out. This initiative organized by two extraordinary esteemed colleagues, doctors Christian Demeff and Jeff Tully, who really in collaboration with I Am The Cavalry have brought a profound a profound level of awareness and acute, tangible understanding to the clinician community, to policymakers, and industry in a way that had never been attained before. There's nothing like experiential learning, like sitting through a clinical simulation. There, for an adult, anyway, there is nothing like that. And that is the way clinicians actually learn as residents or as medical students. And um, it has a lasting impact. So I look back on the years from 2013 to early 2020 as really kind of setting the table really setting the table for monumental activities that were yet to occur and that culminated in FDA's newly received statutory authorities as part of the December 2022 omnibus. Yay! <laughs> but you'll hear more about that soon. Um, so to take us through these later years, I'm, I'm stopping deliberately like right at the cusp, right of, you know, right at early 2020, because it marks obviously a very challenging time for this country, for the world, as we entered into the COVID-19 pandemic. And frankly, you know, for me and the work that I do at FDA, at CDRH, which encompasses more than medical device cybersecurity, a lot of my attention actually needed to turn towards pandemic response as it involved medical devices to the extent that um, I really couldn't be there to support the team and the team's work that had to continue with medical device cybersecurity, especially given that there were on the rise already a lot of healthcare cyber attacks occurring and ransomware and other types of you know software third-party vulnerabilities and things that needed to be dealt with. And we were also in the midst of trying to finalize and draft guidance from 2018 that was still in the works. So there was a lot hanging in the balance. And, and this is really you know, where my team comes in and I, I you know, there is no words really for me to express my appreciation for this team, for all the work that you have done. Because you, you took the ball, you know, you took the ball and kept it going and rolling and you moved it to, you know, where we needed to go. And in a way that um, is just 
mind boggling. I mean, it's really impressive. And, um, and I want to say again, and you'll talk about this a little bit. We did not have the omnibus then, so we still did not have authorities, and we had no appropriations. There was no team here. There were like two people, okay, uh, managing medical device cybersecurity. Two people. Um, so with that, we're going to do this in a little bit like in shifts because I, I do want to give Jessica Wilkerson a chance to come up here and talk a bit about, since she was the newcomer in February, you landed in FDA February, January, 2000, January, January but it's like, all right, see ya. <laughs> um, but I, I would like you for also to give some perspective on the work that you had previously been doing. Um, through your work in energy and commerce, and that's how we initially met, um, and you know, provide that perspective before you kind of move into the work at um, at FDA. For which then also we'll bring up Matt, and um, and then Bo, and then we'll bring the two of you, our latest um, uh, <laughs> newcomers, to the team. Perfect. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, so as, as Suzanne said, I'm Jessica Wilkerson. Uh, I am currently a senior cyber policy advisor and the medical device cybersecurity team lead at the FDA. But um, back in 2013, I was a fresh faced congressional staffer on the Energy and Commerce Committee. Um, and Energy and Commerce, for those of you who don't know, is the House Committee um, that has jurisdiction over healthcare. And so um, at the time, um, for I, when I started with Congress, I was actually I was I was a secretary. I was answering mail. I was answering phones. Um, but I had a computer science background, and uh, there was just at the cusp at the same time that that FDA was really starting to see healthcare and medical device cybersecurity issues. So was Congress, um, and so I started to get pulled into more and more of the healthcare cybersecurity work at the United States Congress. Uh, to the point that that eventually became my job. And I think if I'm remembering correctly, I'm gonna look at Josh. I think it was 2013 that, that we met. January 7th of 2014. Apparently it was January 7th of 2014. <laughs> <laughs> might have been, might have been that close. Yes, yes. Um, but again, you know, I had not been at, at Congress very long. I think I was maybe all of 23 years old. Um, and I remember we had these little meeting rooms that were kind of off to the side. They were like glorified sitting rooms. And we met with Josh in one of them. It was me and the chief counsel for a telecommunications subcommittee at the time. And he started talking about something. I was like, what is it? And I kept looking at my chief counsel. I'm like, do you understand what he's saying? And he was essentially like, let's make nutrition labels for software. And this was right after Heartbleed. And my chief counsel and I were like, no, <laughs> we're, not, we're not doing that. And like, you're never gonna convince anybody to do this. That's gonna be mm. way too expensive. The manufacturers are never gonna go for it. Like, what about all of these, this, that, and the other thing. And, we just, and that, was, that was Josh and I's first meeting. I think I also brought up Haskell at that time. I think I made a, a crack about how, you know, I would also love everybody to be programming in only functional programming languages, but I'm never gonna get that either. Um, and so, you know, it, it became a very interesting relationship because that was my introduction to Josh in a lot of ways. And what had started as, as this very um, contained conversation on what would become software bill of materials and, and my rampant skepticism that that would ever become a thing, and here we are. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it became much more than that because um, at that time, I think even more so in a lot of ways than the FDA, Congress was not ready to accept the hacker community as a resource. Um, you know, if you needed somebody at Congress, you called a lobbyist or you called, you know, you called an established person who would get you their version of their expert who would come in and tell you what the answer was. Um, but what ended up becoming so valuable to me at Congress was I could call Josh and, or Bo and say, hey, I'm having this problem. I need to know about this thing. Who do I talk to? And he would give me somebody. And they wouldn't be a politician. They wouldn't be a DC type. They would be somebody who was a practitioner in the space, usually very unpolished, which I loved. Like, didn't know the bureaucratic speak, didn't know like the right phrases to use at the right times to sort of sell me on whatever it is they wanted. They're like, this is the way that it is. You should do this. Um, and what that ended up leading to in a lot of ways, one was we started coming up with, with 
good ideas of things that we should do. You know, we started at the same time a lot of the ways that FDA was, and this was due to I Am the Cavalry and the connections that, that Josh and others have been making. We embrace coordinated vulnerability disclosure. We started bringing together parties to have conversations on vulnerability disclosure, on um, legacy, on, uh, I think we did, we might not have done something on software bill of materials, but we started pulling these things in, into the work that we were doing because we had a foundation finally. We had people that we trusted. We had people that we could ask. Um, and it, it really did, I think, accelerate and it began to feed off of each other. I would take what Suzanne was doing at FDA and start to support it or build off of it at Congress. Um, and I know that for better or worse, I would send things to Suzanne at the FDA at the on behalf of Congress and essentially say, hey, congratulations, you get to do this now. Because <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've decided that you're going to be doing this. Um, but it, that, that give and take and that acceleration between Congress, between the FDA was so important because usually those two groups are, are at loggerheads. They don't want to cooperate. You know, the agency, Congress is telling the agency to do something that the agency doesn't necessarily want to do. Um, the agencies are doing things that Congress rather they did not. But we had found this partnership, and not only that, we had found a shared group of resources in um, not only the hacker community, but the community that the hacker community had created, if that makes any sense. So they kept touching different people within the industry and bringing them into this group of trusted, this trusted network that mm -hmm. began to be created. And it meant that, you know, sort of, and actually, I, I, if everyone will indulge me, I'll tell a story. So one of the first roundtables that we had, that was kind of, that became my thing, was on coordinated vulnerability disclosure. And we brought together representatives from the medical device manufacturer community, and I want to say the automakers, with, um, with hackers. We put them in a room together, no press, no Congress people. It was just them. We, we st I think we did it like two hours. Everybody had a conversation. We left. And then I guess a couple of months later, a couple of weeks, a couple of months later, two of the representatives ended up on the phone together. Didn't know they were gonna end up on the phone together. But it was, there was a, a hacker who needed to disclose a medical device vulnerability to a medical device company. And the conversation started out very frosty because the medical device company was like, who are you? I don't wanna listen. You know, this is not to Suzanne's point of the medical device manufacturers did not want to be dealing with this. Um, but they recognized each other's voices. These two people who had been at this round table recognize each other's voice and it was essentially like, it's like, like is that Colin? And they're like, yeah. Is that Jen? Yeah. <laughs> and suddenly the entire conversation and the tenor of the conversation had changed because they, the trust was already there. These two already knew each other and could have that, that approach. And it became a very successful collaboration. It became something that, that ended where we wanted it to. It was a successful coordinated vulnerability disclosure. And that would not have happened had the work not gone in previously to establish those relationships and establish that basis of trust. And so I, I can tell you, I'll start moving into some of the other things that I've done, because um, if we, I, I worked to Congress to about 2018, uh, spent a year in the private sector with the Linux Foundation, and then went to the FDA in early 2020. Um, and Suzanne, <laughs> Suzanne is not kidding. <laughs> when she says that it sort of ended up being something of a handoff where I remember I came in, the pandemic had started to brew because it was, it was January, it was December, 2019 when every, the temperature started to climb in terms of, you know, this is going to be something I onboarded on my birthday. So it was end of January came in and like, Hey, what do you want me to do? Like what, here, here I am. I'm, I finally arrived. And they're like, we don't know, like, good luck. Um, we'll, we'll see you when we see you. Like, we gotta deal with this other thing. And my fifth week at FDA, we had a major cybersecurity vulnerability in medical devices. It was several hundred mm -hmm. medical devices impacted with an incredibly serious medical mm -hmm. device vulnerability. And I was just, we had to figure it out. And so, um, you know, but the, the thing was, the work that had been done previous to my arrival at the FDA meant everybody was already kind of prepared. You know, we could call up the press team and they're like, oh, you got another cybersecurity vulnerability? All right. And they like kicked it into like in the ear. And we started talking to the people who, we call them the reviewers, the people who actually look at the files and, and to make the determinations of safety and effectiveness and so on. 
and they were prepared for it and they kind of knew what they were doing um and, and matt was was really instrumental for that for me and you'll you'll hear from Matt lady later but um the the work had the framework was already there so even though we had several hundred medical devices impacted by an incredibly serious cybersecurity vulnerability in two weeks i don't know if any of you have ever tried to get the government to do anything in two weeks um <laughs> We had put out a, a safety communication essentially saying, this is a serious concern. Here's the set of recommendations. Here's what you do. Um, and we had coordinated with so many different people. We were coordinating with the foreign government. We were coordinating with the security researchers who had found the original vulnerability, with the Department of Homeland Security, with the HHS. And it, it happened because of what had already been established. Um, and so I don't know if you want to bring up Matt now or later, but we can, we can sort of talk about 2020 to to when we get the omnibus. Um, but it became something where, again, so the, these, this was the, these were the two. It was just me and this guy. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> the dynamic duo <laughs> is what I called them. Yes. The Howard Center director. It's like, oh, there they go. <laughs> yes. Um, so our, our cybersecurity budget from 2020 to 2023 was $500,000. Mm -hmm. And I was half of that. That's right. <laughs> I was half of that budget. And part of that, you were also detailed. And, and, and part of it, I got, I got <laughs> borrowed by the White House for a year, um, which thrilled FCA to no end that they were paying to have me go work for someone else. But um, At least I negotiated a half. It's true. Okay? She did. She, <laughs> she's, she, she won the argument with the White House. <laughs> so good. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yes. But, um, but no, it became something where, you know, I got to FDA in, in, while there were certainly some stumbling blocks of FDA as a federal agency, there's ways that they do things that I was not familiar with. I will tell you that Congress is usually a huge fan of just ignoring the rules that they make everyone else follow. So I, when, you know, when I was with Congress, I called whoever I wanted. I, I sent people emails whenever I felt like it about whatever I felt like. Um, and with FDA, you know, it was a little bit different. There's you got to talk to some people, make sure you've, you've checked all the various boxes. Um, but we could take the foundation of what had been established and start driving it forward. We didn't have to have the conversation with medical device manufacturers that cybersecurity was important because they already knew that. They might not have believed it or they might not have been willing to fully accept it into their hearts in the way that we wanted them to. But for, I think at that point it would have been six or seven years, they mm -hmm. had been hammered over and over again by FDA, you have to do this. If you would like to sell medical devices in the United States, you have to do this. So I got to come in and say, you already know you have to do this. Let's talk specifics and let's go even further. Let's talk about legacy devices. Let's talk about old, outdated, unsupported things that we know are still in use, but can't be updated, really can't be protected. We talked about that. I spent three years, for those of you who know the Health Sector Coordinating Council, working with a group of about 65 organizations to come up with a big what do we do about legacy devices report um and we also did it internationally mm -hmm. um, another member of our team who who isn't here uh led work on that for internationally and so the the sheer amount of work that was done on that we did something on vulnerability communications about how do you communicate to patients because cybersecurity can be incredibly frightening to um to a patient if you you know if you tell somebody your device can be hacked well that's horrifying. You know, how do, what, what do I do? Do I, do I need to go get the device removed? Do I need to stop removing the, using the device? Um, and so we've been able to, from this foundation of medical device cybersecurity is important. Medical device cybersecurity is patient safety. You do not have a, a safe device if you do not have a cybersecurity device. And I didn't have to rebuild that conversation. That conversation had already been built because of what Suzanne, I am the cavalry, um, had already done. And so um, I will talk a little bit about my White House stuff and then kick it to you. Um, so two th I came in 2020, about, I think it was summer of 2021, sounds right, when I went to, so they established the Office of the National Cyber Director. Right. Some of you may have um, heard from some of the ONCD staff who are here. I got requested to go what's called a detail um, to, to ONCD where essentially you get borrowed by another federal agency. FDA had the joy of continuing to pay my salary <laughs> while I was working 50% of the time for, um, for a different, a different branch. But, um, 
one thing that was amazing to see and amazing to experience at ONCD was FDA was one of the few federal agencies who had such a strong cybersecurity program that we it, were 10 steps ahead of a lot of our federal agency partners, where a lot of them were sort of saying like, we don't really, we don't have any authorities. We don't really understand how this fits into our authorities. We don't really understand how to approach this. We could be like, well, <laughs> would you like our guidance? Would you like our medical device safety action plan, which includes our cybersecurity requests? Would you like our request to Congress for the past five years of please give us explicit cybersecurity authorities um, mm -hmm. to the point that we were briefing other agencies on our process to how to respond to vulnerabilities, to how to respond to incidents, because we'd done it and we'd shown that it worked. And we'd shown that we could work with the, our medical device manufacturer community, was, which was a huge part, because a lot of these agencies were convinced that their regulated entities would never play ball. Like, you know, we're, we're never gonna get them to do this. Um, so a lot of them were a little bit afraid of trying. I got to sort of say, and I got to be the representative to point to the fact that, well, we did it, which means you can probably do it, maybe not in the same way, but you know, there's, there's precedent for it. Um, and it just was an amazing experience to really be there and be able to put medical device cybersecurity on the White House agenda um, and make sure that it was getting brought up to, um, to the you know the first national cyber director uh, we got to have a a big meeting where we brought in 10 healthcare ceos to meet with um meet with the national cyber director and the deputy secretary of health and human services to talk about how important healthcare cybersecurity was and again none of that would have been possible had we not done the work had we not had the receipts so to speak of like why medical device cybersecurity and healthcare cybersecurity was so important um, and that really started in 2014 with a lot of the work that they did. But, um, nah. Sure. <laughs> um, I'm Matt Hazlett. I'm the cybersecurity policy analyst in our Office of Product Evaluation and Quality. So I'm the only member from the FDA team here that is not in Suzanne's office. Um, I created a position in... You adopted. <laughs> <laughs> right. So. I'm very closely work with them. <laughs> There's a lot of dotted lines on my work chart. Um, but I created my position in the Office of Product Evaluation and Quality, which is our pre and post market review offices, as I saw an opportunity to try to further strengthen and build consistency in how we were addressing cybersecurity in the pre and post market arenas. I started in our um, pacemaker and defibrillator review group. So I started out reviewing um, back in 2015, 2016, got involved in uncoordinated vulnerability yes. disclosure processes. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I was on a very steep learning curve. Um, quick aside, I was assigned that task because I was working from home for the first time, one of the first times, and I forwarded the Reuters article to my boss at the same time she was given the report internally, which was me demonstrating interest, and then my entire career changed. Um, so be careful what articles you forward at work. <laughs> This one had a happy ending so far, but <laughs> um, be careful what you forward. Um, so that kicked off really me coming up to speed in cybersecurity work very quickly, working with the people in um, FDA that were tapped in on cybersecurity, working with Suzanne and Seth and Brian Fitzgerald, um, the MITRE colleagues that we had working with us at the time, um, really coming up to speed very quickly and learning cybersecurity through bad security, um, basically honing my gut based off of, well, they said this is bad. I now know that's bad. What's good? Um, <laughs> will someone tell me what that is? Um, but essentially through that process got very involved in a lot of our post-market vulnerability disclosures, started get inv got, um, getting involved in some of our policy development efforts from the lessons learned um, from everything that we were seeing at that time. So working on the 2018 guidance, um, the revision for the 2022, building in a lot of that review experience um, and the lessons learned that we were getting from the different review offices, whether that was the pacemaker space, the diabetes space, insulin 
infusion spaces, um, we were seeing a lot and learning a lot and starting to be able to figure out what really we needed to see. Um, and that really starts to, to show itself in terms of the level of detail. I think the 2014 guidance was nine pages. I think the 2018 was 18 pages. And then I think we're at like 40. Yeah. seven um, yeah. for the 2022 draft. Um, so it definitely started to have more depth in terms of what we were looking at. Um, I was asked to start um, what we call our cybersecurity focal point program. Um, so we have focal point programs in different review disciplines across um, the review offices. Um, the first one was biocompatibility. We have one in electromagnetic compatibility. So areas where the agency wants to have greater consistency in how we're approaching a particular review discipline. Um, I started to lead the cybersecurity group, started forming loosely in 2019. Um, I quickly saw that it was a full-time job. So that was how my position became created in OPAC. Um, to really start focusing on really trying to build out consistency. So the reviews that were taking place in 2014, 2015 may have been more of a checklist exercise of are the elements from the 2014 guidance present to then what we started to focus on as we started seeing more and more post-market issues was incorporating those learnings into our pre-market reviews of those various device spaces and really starting to try to build the consistency of not only what we were seeing in areas with post-market vulnerability disclosures, but also feeding that in across the board to the areas that hadn't gotten the attention of the research community. How do we get ahead um, and start preventing things? Sure. So I, um, it may be helpful to give some examples of, of sort of what we mean when we say, pre, so pre-market is people coming in looking to get approval to actually be able to sell things legally in the United States. Post-market is you have been given approval, now there's an issue, what do we do? Um, and so what we started doing is that in the post-market side of the house, we were seeing issues, we didn't want to see them come up again, we didn't want to be reviewed for the same problems. So what, how could we put something into the pre-market so that then you couldn't pass the FDA approval process without ha having addressed the concern. Um, so I'll start with the one, the first one I can think of, and then I think you can give some examples. So I, here, here's a, a relatively recent one. This one was from 2021. Um, ransomware are a huge problem. We all, we all know that ransomware is a huge problem. Um, what? <laughs> who knew? <laughs> um, we had been thinking for a long time, our nightmare scenario was remote multi-patient simultaneous harm. So essentially that like you were going to have all types, all of one type of medical device, quote unquote, hacked at the same time. And that was our nightmare. Um, we had been waiting or expecting to see in these ransomware incidents that ransomware was actually going to reach the device and was going to start locking up the device and denying patient care. Um, we saw that happen to, some, to a little bit of a degree in WannaCry, but not to the extent that we were sort of waiting to see. Well, 2021 happens, we have a medical device manufacturer who gets hit with ransomware on their corporate network, so not on their device network, if you want to think of it that way. And we're like, all right, well, that's very unfortunate for them, but not necessarily a patient safety impact. So we don't necessarily do anything yet. And then we start hearing things, and I think actually both of you called me separately. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, you really need to look into this. So I gradually start looking into it. And they were right. We absolutely did. Because what had happened is that there had been a design decision made that the devices in the hospital environments were 100% dependent on a customer facing cloud in the manufacturer's environment. So when they took the entire environment down to remediate, none of those devices could communicate to the, to the cloud and they couldn't get any of the information that they needed to actually treat patients. So now we had denial of patient care because of what had happened. And so for the example of, what, of, the, of sort of the point that we're trying to make of what? Uh, it was a while. <laughs> yeah, it was longer than we would have liked. <laughs> Um, we said, okay, 
we now we know that this is a problem. Now we know denial of care based on network inavailability is a problem. And we put in, we started putting into the review process, and you can Matt can talk to this more. Um, essentially, like if you're going to have a device that's dependent on a remote capability, part of the review is going to be explaining to us what happens and how your device continues to operate safely and effectively when that network connection goes away. Um, so what we start looking at is based off of our existing policy, do we have a threat <laughs> um, to be able to ask and highlight a particular area of concern? So we've done some reevaluation of what was in the 2014 guidance, and we have some, a lot of really good hooks um, to ask more information in that guidance. While it's high level, um, it actually addresses a lot. Um, so we start to be able to look at some of those resiliency and availability considerations um, so those are now baked into our review practices of being able to look for are there connection dependencies to network, to Bluetooth devices, to cloud interfaces, and how are um, devices designed to address those dependencies in the event that the connection does down? Does the device fail safely? Does it fail securely in a way where you're still continue to have acceptable levels of device operation in response to that? Um, so that really is how we continue to try to learn from what's happening in pre-market from post-market and start feeding that into our pre-market considerations. Should probably get to Fedora. Oh yeah, we should talk about the omnibus. <laughs> it's very important. <laughs> A little bit. So um, Fedora, uh, sometimes, sometimes referred to as Patch, is the Food and Drug, we just looked at this, Food and Drug Omnibus Reform Act was the specific part of the omnibus that uh, added additional authorities or additional requirements on to FDA. And it included, after five years, half a decade of asking every year <laughs> for Congress, um, explicit cybersecurity regulatory authorities. Because here, here's, the, here's the secret, not a secret, we told everyone this for a long time, um, of FDA. We were reviewing for cybersecurity under what is known as our general safety and effectiveness principles. So our mission is safety and effectiveness of medical devices. We said, we in, and this was, this was Suzanne, um, cybersecurity is part of that. We said cybersecurity, you cannot have a safe device if you don't have a cybersecurity device. And, and the QSR. Also. And the QSR, the quality mm -hmm. system regulation, mm -hmm. which is the, the mm -hmm. overarching framework for, for how FCA um, and medical device manufacturers ensure safety and effectiveness across the board. Um, but it, there was still arguments that we would have with medical device manufacturers and others about, well, you know, yes, there's a cybersecurity issue, but it's hypothetical or it doesn't actually pose a safety risk. And there was a, not a gap exactly, but there was a very strict connection that would have to be made between a cybersecurity thing that we wanted in safety and effectiveness, because that was where our authorities were coming up from. We had to say this was a safety and effectiveness issue in order to really drive it forward under what we were doing. And we weren't wrong, but it was, it was a long conversation and it was longer than we wanted and it was more often than we wanted. We would have to go back, Matt's review folks would essentially start having these conversations with the manufacturers, you need to do X, Y, Z to shore up your cybersecurity. And they'd say, well, do we? Um, and so, the, the difference that came in, in Fedora and Patch and the Omnibus for us is it explicitly says, and we really cannot overstate how important and how impactful this is going to be for us, and I think in a lot of ways already has been, um, you must have reasonable assurance of cybersecurity in your device. By law, by law, you must have reasonable assurance of cybersecurity in your device. We get to look at it on the pre-market side. You get to, you have to prove to us before we even will give you legal marketing authority that this device has a reasonable assurance of cybersecurity. And it's got a few different elements. Um, you probably can rattle them off better than I can. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll let Matt talk to them. But um, it is it it really is. It's we 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 try to make sure that folks understand. We were reviewing for cybersecurity. We had an incredibly robust cybersecurity review process. But this is an acceleration. This is a, such a, a strengthening of everything that we were able to do before. And it's, it's gonna be the next 10 years of, mm -hmm. of what we're able to do and what we're able to accomplish. But mm -hmm. if you wanna talk a little bit more about. Sure. 
Um, so with the authorities, we were given the ability to review pre-market submissions for um, devices that have connectivity to be able to um, look for post-market plans for making updates um, for addressing vulnerabilities and incidents, being able to review pre-market documentation for whether there's a reasonable assurance that the device and related systems are cyber secure. Um, that's a really fundamental new aspect to being able to review against for the explicit aspect of cybersecurity. Um, and the third main element is the software bill of materials. So we have a, this, these new authorities that really give us a lot of ability to be able to look at greater details um, and really look under the hood at what devices are, um, how they're designed, how they're able to ensure cybersecurity and how that's going to be maintained throughout the total product lifecycle for the device. Um, so in terms of implementing those aspects, we've made training available for over a thousand review and management staff um, to be able to consistently look at the different documentation deliverables and assess whether those provide a reasonable assurance that the device is cyber secure. Um, and we've been able to build this out as a program where we'll be able to iterate on um, these processes throughout um, future guidance updates. So we have kind of our ground structure fully laid out and built for the implementation of these authorities. And we're just gonna continue to evolve and mature um, that program as we go forward and also look at where else um, how else we'll be looking at these authorities as we go on. So the requirement, requirements around making available post-market updates, making sure manufacturers are delivering on those updates um, and following those plans and processes are all things that um, we're going to be looking to make sure um, are captured, making sure that coordinated vulnerability disclosure programs are stood up um, in being used and monitored um, so that cybersecurity issues are more timely addressed um, and more routinely addressed um, throughout the life cycle. Yeah, and I think, um, I know we want to bring Bo up as well, um, but I think maybe the one thing that we haven't talked about that has certainly <laughs> become my life lately um, is, you know, we we are seeing, and I, I think this is where the security research community, the next iteration of I am the cavalry or whatever the I am the cavalry becomes, um, can really become part of the the evolution and the strengthening and, and the advancement of, of where we, we plan to head. One, as you heard, you know, we have these new authorities um, that the device has to remain secure <laughs> over the, the, the security life cycle, which it already did but now we we can very explicitly point to that um and if there are issues we can now point to law that says that they have to be addressed and so you know 10 years ago we had people coming to us and saying hey here's a security vulnerability we'd like to see it closed please <laughs> continue to do so um continue to come and tell us about it and even you know more so than that we have seen um more and more cyber incidents that are impacting medical devices and medical device delivery and healthcare delivery in general. Um, and that's another area that, you know, we are, are strengthening what we're doing and trying to get faster, better, more effective at how we respond and how the sector responds. Um, but it's an area where, you know, the role of the security research community, like it has played over uh, the last 10 years, can really play in the next 10 years is help us understand how we, get ahead of this problem, how we continue to strengthen the sector to the point that, um, you know, we, we see less of these or they last less time or they have less impact. Um, because of course, you know, you can, I would love to get to the point where we can have a medical device cybersecurity incident that we're just not worried about because the devices are designed resiliently. We know that it's only gonna last a couple of hours to a day or two days and everybody knows the steps and what they're gonna do to respond. Um, we're not there yet, but I think, you know, over the next 10 years, we'll, we're gonna definitely try and get there. And we definitely um, would want all the help that we can get in figuring out what that's going to look like. Uh, but do we wanna bring Bill? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, no, thank you. Thank you both. Um, Bo, why don't you come up and join us? And um, it'd be great if you could share your perspective on all of the, you know, the work that you've been involved in as part of, you know, this entire effort. It'd be great. Yeah, sure. Um, so we've been talking about uh, 10 years of successes with on the cavalry with the FDA and others. Uh, and uh, Suzanne and Jessica in particular took you back to, you know, 2014. Uh, but I'll wind back the clock another decade almost. Um, I started my career working for a healthcare provider. And uh, one day uh, the organization got hit with um, some kind of a network worm. Uh, I don't even remember the name of it at this point. Um, the, the authors of the network worm got eventually arrested and, and extradited to the US and probably still in jail, I don't know. Um, but uh, it affected our servers the first day. And the second day I got a call from the natal intensive care unit uh, from some doctors there uh, who said, hey, our, our fetal heart monitors are down. This is the thing that, that makes sure that the uh, often premature uh, babies um, is able to get the care that they need when they need it, you know, in real time. It, it makes sure that uh, the doctors, the nurses, the clinicians, uh, everybody knows what is going on with that patient. Uh, and basically every 15 minutes, those monitors were rebooting. Um, so like, hey, look, I know you just work on like computers and stuff, but like I heard that some of these medical devices are computers and every time this thing boots up, I see a Windows screen, like, can you help us? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, I'll do what I can. Um, so uh, I ended up calling the manufacturer and the manufacturer just basically said, hey, look, really sorry, but um, you know, it's a, it's a medical device. We can't, we can't change it. I'm like, yeah, but I'm just asking you to get the malicious software off of it. It's already changed. They're like, yeah, hands are tied. You know, the FDA, they're the baddies here. Um, they, they, they told us that we can't, put any updates on it or affect it or, or it'll take away our certification. I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's a lie because <laughs> I use this thing called Google and I found on the internet where I think it was 2003, you guys put out a communication that said specifically uh, updates are safe. They don't affect your certification status. So like, I don't know, man, I'm just reading from my script. Uh, it's frontline help desk. Um, like, I don't know what to tell you. So I was like, all right, well, that kind of sucks. Um, so I uh, went and worked with the, uh, the administrator of the hospital um, and got a, a justification to go and fix the problem. Um, so what that looked like was uh, using the same exploit that the, the malware used. I hacked into all of these, it was about eight or 10, uh, hacked into these medical devices, uh, dropped the patch, killed the malware, rebooted the box, and it stayed up. Um, and the doctors were able to get back to doing the thing that they did. The nurses were in there monitoring the patients and saving lives. Um, and I think that uh, that it's a testament to how far we've come in this industry that um, I don't think any medical device maker would try to pull that today. Um, They'd have a very bad time. <laughs> it would. because. <laughs> I know who to call right? <laughs> to call them um, to set their record straight in no uncertain terms. Uh, and um, throughout that journey from, you know, whatever that was, I don't even remember 2005, six, seven, something like that uh, until now um, there've been, a, we've made a lot of progress. I say we very inclusively because I think Susanna met you at, a, at an Atlantic council thing in like 2013. Um, and uh, we just started doing I Am The Cavalry. Uh, and I remember that uh, it was you and who was the other guy that was there? No, it wasn't Brian. It was- uh, It wasn't Seth, was it? No, it wasn't no. Seth, it was- Nick, Nick, Nick Thacker. Thacker. Yes. Yeah, Nick Thacker. So I remember we were yeah. sitting on like opposite sides yeah. of a, a square round table, yeah. uh, which is a thing. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and just the yeah. openness and inquisitiveness that, that you guys had to all of this, mm. like, Hey, look, you know, we don't know everything. 
Uh, turns out this is one of those areas we've got to get better at. So we want everybody's help to get better. And I was mm -hmm. like, this is really refreshing. This is cool. If, is this what government people are like? <laughs> um, little did I know. Uh, and it was it was really great to start those conversations then um, to start building that trust. And, uh, and as security researchers at Black Hat, at uh, DEF CON, at B-Sides were uh, having these discussions about uh, vulnerabilities that they had discovered and the lack of responsiveness from the medical device makers um, to see the FDA kind of step mm -hmm. up and say, like, it, it's not OK to have these things be perpetuated. Uh, we've got to do something to fix it uh, and take a stand. Um, I think uh, if it hadn't been you in that seat, if it had been somebody else, mm -hmm. they would have just been like, yeah, I mean, medical device makers know a lot about making medical devices. I don't know a lot of hackers who know a lot about making medical devices. We're just gonna like stick with the, the party line. Um, but I think, you know, for all of the success criteria and the reasons why I am the cavalry has worked, empathy, understanding, building trust, listening, uh, I think you have those same things. Um, and I wish that there could be a Suzanne in every agency. Um, yeah. There is not yet, uh, but <laughs> but uh, there are a lot more mm. Suzanne-like folks at agencies today than there were 15 years ago, 10 years ago, um, and I'm very happy for that. Uh, to be able to do that, I mean, we didn't even talk about, uh, I worked at the FDA for a year, not on Suzanne's team, on another team. Mm. Um, going back even farther to 1974, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act, where um, part of that act is like, hey, look, you have to build medical devices in a sterile environment, clean room, like make sure that they, they're not infected. Well, what happens if medical devices have software? Like wipe down the keyboard? Like, I don't know. How do you have a sterile programming environment? Like that's kind of not a thing. Um, and to be able to, so then part of my job was to translate the 1974 act into modern standards of development. Um, and what was really cool is, is being able to, we had a handful of medical device makers that came in. Some of them were better than others, uh, more advanced and, um, or I'll say more uh, in tune with modern software development practices. Um, and then to be able to take and build on some of the work that uh, Suzanne and Jessica and Seth um, Nick had done, Brian Fitzgerald too, mm -hmm. um, had done, uh, was really powerful to just take that and port that into what was going to be a new pathway to market and to talk to medical device makers who, um, some of them didn't even think about security when they were designing it, de designing their devices. Uh, surprisingly, some of the ones who didn't think about security when we started talking with them, like, oh yeah, how do you design software without doing that it's like have you heard of software bill of materials they're like no what's that and i explained it to them they're like oh yeah of course we do that everybody does that because they're like a little startup right mm -hmm. and they looked around at their colleagues uh big huge medical device makers and the medical device makers the other ones were like you can't do that it's impossible like <laughs> what this is like the complete opposite but i think that's symbolic of the transition that's being made uh, in healthcare and medical devices. Um, and I don't know, I don't want to ramble on too much because I know we want to, we want to flip it. So maybe I'll take the opportunity to, to set up a pivot, which is um, this has been a success story working with the FDA. Not every industry has an FDA. And as we've talked about in this track for a couple of days, um, some of them are uh, lack a, a lot of the things that healthcare and medical devices have. Um, in the absence of a Suzanne at every regulatory agency, how can we take this blueprint and make it more successful? Is it even possible to do that? Or how can we take the lessons learned uh, and build on those to make other industries um, help them come along uh, maybe more quickly because they have a roadmap to follow um, and you know, to, to overuse a tagline to make us all safer sooner together. Mm -hmm. 
Back to you. Thank you. I want to thank you, Bo. I want to give my two team members who haven't had a chance to get up here and introduce themselves um, as well. You know, one of the things we talked about on the omnibus is down? the additional authorities. Um, we also got appropriations that allowed us to not only expand our team, um, and we have two recent members uh, that have joined the team, um, but also to really create more of what now is a sustainable program in medical device cybersecurity. And so um, start with you, Monroe, because I think you've been with us a little bit longer, and then Arvin, and you could just provide, um, introduce yourself, provide some background. Um, oh, you have an interesting story as well in terms of how you came to us. <laughs> yeah. um, and, um, you know, and, and what is it that, so I'm going to pose a question to the, each of you as well, given, you know, that you've come in the more recent time, what is it that you, you know, if you could have your greatest wish or what you aspire for in terms of where you want to see things going? you know, um, and knowing the current state, what would that look like? Mm. What would that be? Yeah, mm -hmm. awesome question. Yeah, so I think actually this week, um, as we talk about anniversaries of both I Am The Calvary, of the FDA program, I think this week is actually my one year anniversary at the FDA. Oh, yes. um, so uh, good to be there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of came from an interesting experience of um, coming to medical devices and medical device cybersecurity. It all started as an undergrad student. Um, bored in the summer uh, that can lead to a lot of good things and can lead to a lot of bad things sometimes when you're a bored undergraduate student in the summer. Um, but I had the opportunity to work with a professor um, who was doing research on medical devices and consumer products. Um, and so we were doing physiology studies and I think I kind of had that technical brain somewhere of, as I was working with them. I was like, there's a lot of potential security and privacy problems with these devices. And so I think that just kind of planted the seed in my, in my brain. And so I had always been kind of interested in policy and medicine and that technical side. And so as I was trying to figure out what to do after uh, undergrad, I said, you know, where do those worlds emerge? And so I ended up in public health of, you know, having that perspective of helping people working in the healthcare sector, but also thinking about policy, bringing those things together. So I ended up in a public health program. And as I went through graduate school, I kind of kept being interested about this technology side. So I ended up working for a, a contracting company and worked a lot with military healthcare facilities. Uh, ended up going to HHS and worked in the chief technology officer's office for a while working on digital health issues. Um, and even had a little bit of a side jut over to the forest service to work on policy issues. But throughout this entire time, there's always kind of that medical device aspect, you know, at the back of my brain of you know, such an interesting area where you impact patient lives every single day. Um, and it has all these you know, different challenges that all merge kind of in, in one nexus. And so I eventually ended up um, at CISA, where I worked in the National Risk Management Center and got to work not only on healthcare issues, but kind of critical infrastructure issues as a whole and r do a lot of interesting risk analysis there. So I really enjoyed that experience of kind of, you know, honing the craft of thinking about healthcare as critical infrastructure. And I think some of my CISA colleagues probably got annoyed after a while, but I was still always interested in medical devices so I, I remember in one situation we were uh, going on a little side tangent here. Uh, you know, we had some extra time, and so we were proposing some projects. I'm thinking about you know critical manufacturing and raw materials, and they're like, great, that's a perfect topic. You know, go down that path. And I was like, but what if we think about it in the context of medical devices? And they're like, oh my goodness, like <laughs> what are we gonna do with you? And so there was always kind of that that thread of being interested in health technologies that I had. Um, and so when my, my time at, at CISA came up, I was uh, nearing the end of my graduate program, which in grad school is a product of a really good cyber workforce training program, the Cyber Corps program, scholarship for service that's run out of the National Science Foundation. So I had the opportunity to kind of be this weird person of being trained in public health as a graduate degree, but also having that kind of Cyber Corps side of you know, being a potential future leader in cybersecurity. Um, and so kind of as I was in that role, I ended up um, through some connections uh, coming to the FDA as a fellow. And um, this is a lesson to all students. Uh, in the first five days I was at the FDA, um, at the end of the week they asked me, would you like to interview for a job here? <laughs> so I had barely even been there for a few days, but they really spoke to, you know, the, you know, the interest that I had to the topic. and. Um, you know, and I could immediately see within those five days of 
the, you know, the team that I was working with and the people that were here at the FDA. Um, so I never ended up leaving. I ended up staying at the FDA, um, but it was a really good experience. And I think I'm kind of a, a child of, of two different truths of one being um, that medical device cybersecurity, healthcare cybersecurity, cybersecurity as a whole is really uh, a product of having multidisciplinary people involved. So whether it's physicians, public health practitioners, engineers, attorneys, um, you know, all the other people that are involved. And so I think, you know, that's, you know, kind of the village people of the FDA team, but also <laughs> an, an example of, you know, cybersecurity as a whole. Um, but I really kind of appreciated that truth. But I came from that background of, um, you know, being in those, interested in those different areas. And that really becomes an asset when we think about dealing with patients and these impactful kind of topic areas. And I think the second truth is how impactful engaging and, and uh, having mentors and going to events like this can be. I don't think Josh or, or Bo know this, but the way I got to the FDA was through a cyber med summit. One of my professors, um, it was at one of the one of the ones, one of my professors said, you should go to this event. And so I went and got to meet um, some different people. And I eventually met Kevin Fu, who was working Thanks. at the FDA at the time. And he said, why have you not worked here yet? <laughs> yeah. um, and so it was just one of those examples of where I wouldn't be at the FDA because of an I Am The Calvary event. And so I think it's, you know, it's a good example of, you know, kind of how those things, not even just when we talk about, you know, the really substantial impacts of thinking about, you know, legislation and, and, and policy um, and the impact that both the FDA and I Am The Calvary has made in those spaces, but also that, that small impact you make with individual people. Of that student that walks up to you after an event, um, you may spark that interest in them or you may have that opportunity that's just perfect for their perspective or for their skills, their expertise area. Um, and so I think that's a good example is that we kind of celebrate the I Am The Calvary of um, where you can kind of not only bring your different perspective, but also kind of facilitate uh, that, that growth in others and you know, have that next generation of both the cyber workforce and kind of uh, leaders and in, in public service. So yeah, that's kind of my deal and I'll pass it over to my colleague Arvin who can. I just want to say, I mean, I, I love that. I love that story, but, and I should say, and we also know gems when we see them, okay? So you know, not everybody gets, a, gets a, a request for an interview after five days. <laughs> <laughs> a unique scenario, certainly, but I think those gems are in are in many other places. So if you know uh, how to look for them and and identify them and uh, take action when you see them, yes. I think is the lesson we probably learned from that. But yeah, don't let it be five days. <laughs> uh, hi everyone, my name is Arvind Skandarni. I uh, I am I was honored to be joined uh, joined this beautiful team at uh, about ten months ago. So I'm very, very new in, to FDA and also to the healthcare. I, uh, my background is computer engineering and electrical engineering, and I was working for Patent and Trademark Office for 14 and a half years, um, where I was uh, out of college 2008 to started uh, Patent Office. And I was working purely on networks and uh, networking applications. and. Then my wife at the time, well, she was working at FDA. My brother-in-law later, uh, later on joined FDA. And uh, I was seeing these two very enthusiastic in, uh, medical devices and uh, all that. So in 2010, I decided to come to FDA. And obviously, I wasn't successful. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't in the gym yet. Uh, so. I went back to school, got my master's. During the end of my uh, master program at GWU, I, uh, I saw a very, very big need in cybersecurity in the patent office. And that's how I entered patent uh, in cybersecurity field. And I was working on uh, pure networking applications and then all the cryptography stuff that came in, all the uh, AI stuff that started to pour in. And later on in 2015, 16 timeframe, all blockchain stuff came in and I was the only, one of the many, a few uh, people who knew what blockchain is and how that works. So a lot of applications came to me in uh, blockchain stuff. And, <clears throat> excuse me, fast forward to 2020 when the pandemic hit and we all started working from home and I'm working on this table, my wife is on the other side. And she's working 17, 18, 19, 20 hours a day working on this uh, new COVID test stuff. And 
uh, first EUA that came from, uh, of course, she was the, the uh, manufacturer at that, that time. She was at BD company. And uh, this uh, COVID test that she, they were uh, developing and EUA for that. And I see her so eager and so passionate about what she's doing. I said, this is the time. I need to get out of here and do that. In this pandemic time, and I'm not doing anything in public health. So, um, I issued over 12, uh, 1,200 patent applications just to make companies richer. <laughs> so no impact on uh, public health whatsoever. So um, again, fast forward in 2022, I had the privilege of joining this team, thanks to Linda, our uh, boss. Uh, and uh, in October of 2022, I switched to FDA, and since then it's been wonderful. I've been uh, working with uh, as wonderful Jessica, Matt, uh, Suzanne, and Afton, and uh, Monroe. And our and we, back and at home. We have two <laughs> colleagues at home. Uh, we have Lisa, who joined after me, and uh, Tali, who is. Uh, who has been with FDA for a very long time. She was the re lead reviewer and now she's with us. Uh, so it's been a great journey and keep learning and part of stuff that I'm working on and passionate about it's the artificial intelligence and effects of artificial intelligence on medical devices, how we can use AI to secure medical devices. And later on, uh, uh, bringing the aspect of quantum computing and how quantum can help us and the bad news about quantum is the encryption system that is going to break. So post-quantum encryption that is being standardized by end of probably next July by NIST, all the hash-based, lattice-based uh, encryption system that are coming to make everything more secure for us. So it's been a, quite a beautiful, nice journey for me. Thank you, Thank you Thank both. You. Well, and we actually used up a fair amount of time in this session. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes. yes. I don't know if, if is there time for a little Q and A or folks yeah, in the. Minutes. So we, yeah. we do have time for. Mm -hmm. We do. Oh, I turn my mic. You want to use mine? <laughs> I think I can fix it. We do have we do have some time for questions, and while the rest of you are thinking about questions, I have a question. For the Honorable Dr. Schwartz, <laughs> um, it's been quite a journey, right, over the last nine, ten years. Can you uh, can you share with us your thoughts? You've seen a, you've seen a lot, right? Sure. What what is in your heart for what your organization should be doing in this space as it relates to security research and the Calvary over the next ten years? What, is, what does a 10 year plan look like for you? Mm. Going forward, you're saying? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. I, I think what resonates with me a lot um, is, although I, I'd love to be selfish and continue to cultivate the relationship with the I am the Calvary and security researcher community for work that we do, and I am very selfish about that, I think the notion and, and um, I don't know if it was Jessica that pointed out, but the notion of really like paying it forward and um, really being able to think about how what we've done can serve uh, perhaps as a blueprint for the broader public good, right, um, in other sectors um, and how can we help do that. Um, it's, it's perhaps aspirational. Um, it's maybe a tad outside of my FDA mission because I've got a lot on you know to deal with in terms of FDA but to the extent that it's for the betterment of uh, you know of humankind in terms of other sectors and drawing upon really being able to identify what has been you know the what has worked and why has it worked um, and potentially looking towards how that might be applicable to other areas. I think that, you know, that's, that's exciting. That resonates with me. Um, we certainly have 
within our own space of healthcare and public health as a sector, the broader healthcare cybersecurity arena to deal with. And so even broadening it out, out that circle to outside of medical devices, to other medical product areas, to other parts of what is consistent within, what, what is included within healthcare is of interest as well. And it's in areas where we've already started to try to assert influence um, internally within the agency, within FDA, as well as with our uh, sister agencies at HHS. Um, and I think that um, there's definitely opportunity for the I Am The Calvary community to perhaps be a further you know, driver in some of these areas. Um, you know, I, I think that um, it would be um, disingenuous for me to say that, yeah, you know, the FDA, we came along, we've done all this, and yes, we've done this with I Am The Cavalry and the research community, but there was a fair amount of the prompting and the pushing and the driving that was coming from security researchers knocking on our door. Um, and that becomes an important driver um, to bringing about change, to bringing about that kind of transformation. Um, and there are certainly other areas um, within the medical product space and beyond within healthcare that I think um, if as members of the security researcher community taking up that cause, you know, mobilizing um, and doing so with empathy and what we've talked about, there is opportunity to help partner and bring about change. Thank you for that. Um, so there's an opportunity for people to identify questions I don't see any questions, so uh, taking the moderator privilege, I'm going to ask a really hard question. Um, Are all the questions for me? <laughs> well, uh, well in, in, actually, in, for, for you and the team. Okay. So, t t Je Jessica, okay. There is a question. Um, okay, so we will get to your question next. But it's hard moderator, one first. moderator privilege. <laughs> so, ransomware is a scourge. Mm -hmm. And I recall seeing very recently a slide that indicated in the last year, 700 hospitals, last five in the last five years, 200 hospitals have closed. They're not going to reopen. Mm. What are the options for the FDA HHS, other government entities, CISA, National Guard, to bring these little community hospitals. It, it, they're, they're in a tough spot, right? Because mm -hmm. doctors don't want to live there. It, the economics are really hard. They're not going to probably find, you know, each hospital going to find Two or three or five hundred thousand dollars to up their cybersecurity game. Sure. So, as you've thought about it, because Jessica, I know you've thought about this. What what do you see as being maybe a recipe for how the government can can partner with local communities to bring about some type of resolution to this current scourge? Mm. This is awful. Yeah, I'm going to have Jessica respond since she's taken a seat at the table. <laughs> I have come back. Um, yeah, so, so I, I think there's a there's a couple of different elements to this, right? Because if you think about a, a hospital and, and getting hit by ransomware and, or a cyber incident, um, in, in general, there's a lot of different pieces. And for better or worse, we have a very fragmented regulatory system here in the United States and who has what parts um, can, can be very complex. I think on the FDA side of the house, our biggest goal is with the new authorities, with the acceleration of our program, the growth of the, um, the team that we have, that less and less medical device cybersecurity risk exists 
because we are catching that risk before it actually manages to get into environments. So medical devices are just more inherently secure and securable over time. So they are not going to be um, the source of the problem or they're not going to be affected uh, is, is our end goal. They're going to be resilient to cyber threats. I think um, to what Suzanne was saying about the, the evolution of, you know, we have benefited from the security researchers community uh, expertise uh, and advice over the years. I think what we're starting to see is um, because of a lot of external pressure, not necessarily from the security research community, but from others, um, the rest of healthcare is, is starting to see that they need to take a very similar approach. Uh, and so I can say, because I've experienced this, I've sat in on these calls and these experiences, they're starting to look at not only from the cybersecurity perspective, but from the same way that we do, from looking at the whole of our authorities question. Um, you know, there's a lot of reporting that hospitals have to do um, in order to stay certified with their different regulatory regimes. A lot of hospitals live or die by billing private insurance and Medicare and Medicaid. And if you think about it, all of that billing takes place electronically. And if you can't submit your bills electronically and if you can't get reimbursed, you can't get reimbursed for your Medicare and Medicaid for a couple of weeks, that might be the difference between you staying open and staying closed. So I, there are conversations that are starting to happen that are not necessarily cybersecurity focused of, you know, can we look at other areas of relief and helping these organizations bridge that gap between having an issue and, and being able to recover on come and come out the other side. I think from a cybersecurity perspective, um, from a whole of community approach with the FBI, with CISA, with, with HHS, we're starting to look at, you know, can CISA send cybersecurity experts to go fix the equipment? If they don't have cybersecurity experts themselves, can we, can we send them? from the, um, the resourcing and the staffing need, you know, we've talked about there's something called disaster medical assistance teams, DMATS, so I don't yes. know if I got that um, acronym correct, but essentially can we have something like that for cybersecurity incidents? Can you send nurses and doctors and other specialists who know how to operate without technology and they can still deliver care? Um, you know, how do we bring the entire force of the United States government to bear so that these hospitals are not on their own um, with these kinds of incidents happen? And, and frankly, speaking of trust building, how can we give these hospitals and other organizations a measure of comfort that they're actually willing to call and ask for help? Because I will tell you, mm. it's pretty rare. Mm -hmm. They do not want to call the government because they're afraid that they're not going to receive help. They're going to receive fines and they're going to receive blame. And so... Um, I think in, in a lot of the same ways that FDA 10 or so years ago was really starting to evolve um, and, and learn the, the art of the possible here, I think that that's starting to happen. I think um, encouraging that kind of behavior on, on the government's part to the greatest extent possible is, is something that you all can help with. Um, creative ideas about how to bridge some of those gaps, about uh, ways to, to help these kinds of institutions recover are, are there things that are really going to help do that. Uh, I'd like to ask you to uh, continue on the theme that you brought up of sharing the wealth of information and experience with other industries. In particular, uh, I've been thinking a lot about the dichotomy between information technology and operational technology, as the term is sometimes used. Talking about those programmable logic controllers and sensors and actuators that increasingly get entangled with the IT network. And a lot of cybersecurity research and defense is focused on IT networks, but uh, there seems to be a paucity of answers for operational technology. And I wonder if you can see any parallels in your experience or any advice that you can project towards this realm where yeah, among the 16 critical operate, uh, critical infrastructure sectors, there's, you know, quite a, a, a uh, not mystery, but uncertainty about how to proceed because there's recognizing there's vulnerabilities there. We haven't had our Cuyahoga River yet mm. in those things, but we may be coming close. Mm. Do you want to take that? Sure. Um, so I think it's it's interesting that you bring up the the ITOT divide um, because it's actually something that we 
we deal with on a pretty regular basis because we are on the OT side more so than anything, the cyber physical side, medical devices thought of as, as operational technology. Um, and I will say again, mostly because of the, the way that the, the last 10 years have evolved of the security research community is finding vulnerabilities and responding to vulnerabilities in the medical device sector is, is kind of just understood. People just, that we just do it. Um, I think to the, but one thing that I will say that that's an important element and, and this may hopefully start getting at what you're thinking of, but maybe a slight tangent. We have actually run into the situation where sometimes the missed connection between trying to do OT and cyber physical research and vulnerability response and doing IT is that things that you can do in IT, you can't do in OT. Um, and so you'll have research done or best practice. We actually run into this with other federal agencies where federal agencies are proposing best practices that are IT based and trying to put them in an OT environment. And we have to say, we can't do that. You cannot do that. You cannot put multi-factor authentication on a medical device in an emergency room, <laughs> for example. <laughs> um, and so I think part of it is one, just an educational issue on the government side of the house of, you know, different technologies are in different environments. They're used for different purposes. And you can have the same computer in an enterprise environment, in a manufacturing environment, in a healthcare environment, and they can have three different sets of best practices. And, and we, we need folks to understand and, and apply them in different settings. So I, I think there can be a, a translation issue where people on the OT side stop listening if people come with IT best practices that, that don't apply and on the same thing, if you're trying to do an OT thing in an IT environment, it, it becomes that issue. But I, I think maybe what I would say on the broader side of how do we get other critical infrastructure sectors to sort of recognize this, I would say the biggest turning point for me personally, um, this was even when I was still in college uh, and, and sort of coming into healthcare cybersecurity is um, Understanding that cybersecurity is not an IT issue. It can be, but it can be a safety issue. And I think the, the really key part for a lot of regulators is making the connection between this is not an IT, pro we are not asking you to solve an IT problem, we are asking you to keep people safe. And so if you can make the connection between exploitation of this OT vulnerability can lead to this, and that is going to have these safety impacts, um, you can generally, I think, get people's attention and understanding a lot more, especially, I, I actually have found it, for example, being very successful, maybe say it a little cavalierly too, sometimes, and I'm like, I don't really, it just, if, if it helps you, just imagine that the hospital that has been hit by ransomware burned down, or it flooded. Like, you, people know, okay, the hospital has flooded, we're gonna do this, this, and this. The hospital has burned down, we're gonna do this, this, and this. But somehow we still have, it like breaks their brains when it's a cyber incident. Um, so I think on, on some of the OT side, it's, it's framing it as a safety issue. It's comparing it to natural and man-made hazards of just think about it like the, the thing just broke. You know, the, the bridge fell over, now what? Um, and then they can, kind of apply their, their usual problem solving sets to that uh, and kind of work backwards to get to the missing pieces about cybersecurity. I hope that answered your question. I don't know. <laughs> it is coming. <laughs> I appreciate you bringing up uh, a lot of those things. I've dealt with a lot of hospitals and their response to most of these cybersecurity instances is cyber insurance. It's much <laughs> easier to mitigate the problem <laughs> by paying for the response. I mean, they're used to doing this because they have malpractice insurance. So when a doctor murders a patient, they just pay the money. So now when we have a cyber incident, they just go and call the cyber insurance company and they will decide if they're gonna keep the hospital open or if they're gonna shut it down, depending on which is cheaper. How do you think we can start addressing this problem and improving the safety of all the patients? Because that's what we're concerned about. Right. And I'm not, concerned, I'm not convinced that the administration is concerned about that. I think they're more concerned about the dollar amounts. Let me ask a question. When you say the administration, you mean the hospital administration? Yes. CPOs and CFOs and 
concerns. You know, I, I think it, a lot of this does come back down to really, um, you know, the the coalition building, the collaboration, bringing, you know, all stakeholders together to raise awareness and to educate on just what you're talking about, of this being a safety concern or a safety matter. Cyber insurance is by no means going to be a solution or a panacea. Um, that's not to say that we're going to, you know, that... Uh, we are going to be able to completely get rid of cyber attacks or ransomware attacks ever occurring. We know that that's a, you know, that's likely to be an eventuality, but the answer certainly isn't to just, you know, kind of pay it out and have cyber insurance. The answer is to really again come back down to basic principles of preparedness for any type of an event, um, as, as Jessica's talking about. And that's, I think, why things translated very smoothly for us back years ago in the kind of programming that we had, which was focused on other kinds of events and how you're doing and you're doing disaster preparedness or emergency preparedness. We're concerned about Life, you know, loss of life or limb or patient safety. And so that drilling down on that piece of it, and there is so much that can be done right now. There are so many resources out there. There are so many communities, if you will, or collectives to become a part of um, that um, we, we really would, you know, really need to encourage that kind of participation. I guess I'm going to close this out. Yeah. Um, I'll say a bunch more stuff in private, but uh, um, I watched the cavalry launch uh, yesterday before my keynote, mm -hmm. and some things hit me. And I just want to share some of the hitting with you. Um, in the B sides launch, I said uh, I have no interest in finding and fixing a single flaw and a single medical device. I want to hack the incentives to make them all safer. Mm. And when we said that, it was a moonshot. Mm -hmm. It wasn't serious. We had no idea if anyone would listen to us. Our, your reputation was nobody cares about cybersecurity, no one listens. At DEF CON, I, I told the room people will have to die first before they're going to listen to us. They said, well, why bother? And I said, because when that moment comes, I want to have the trust and the scaffolding so that we could be safer sooner and have a prompt and agile response and they'll turn to us instead of lesser people with lesser motives and lesser ideas. And no idea where things would go, but it's because of you. You didn't wait 10 years for people to die. You did the safety communication because it was the right thing to do. We didn't have a moonshot to change and hack the incentives for all 10,000 medical device makers. We have a patch act. We did exactly what we said we would do, and none of it would have happened without your courage and our shared common cause, common purpose, and common philosophy that it takes complementary skills from a lot of different teammates in this room and in your corridors. And you didn't just make medical devices safer, you set the pace and the tone for many of your colleagues in the White House, in Congress, internationally. We wanted to make the world a safer place in you enabled 90% of that. Well, we've done this as a team. I'm humbled and I'm embarrassed by the compliments, but um, it's really been a very much a team effort. And um, it, uh, you know, it comes back to the importance of bringing community together. It really does. What we can accomplish when we work together. So we're looking forward to what the future has in store for I Am The Cavalry and um, continuing the work that we've been doing, even if, as it may take on a very different face. That's, that's okay. That's mm -hmm. fabulous. Uh, please join me in giving a hand for the doctor and the staff. Thank you so much.